The times, the love, the legacy. In 1929, East Street was still called the New Road. Ice was still bought by the block. Persons of color had to use the back door to enter mainstream establishments, and you had to be formally dressed to walk down Bay Street. This was the year the Popo family moved their family homestead from the Berry Islands to Nassau, and along with them, young Leroy Popo, who was delighting in the new experiences as a little boy. At the same time, young Louise Ramming was enjoying life as a youngster as well. Times were hard for many of the time, but the memories of this day endear the warmest of thoughts. Living Mason Edition. When the sand school of Shelley Street and Train Dawson Street. They moved, come down East Street. It wasn't East Street then, it was New Road. Live through Stone Alley. From there we move up and on stand, that is off Camp Road. When I was about, I think about five or six, it was four, I had four siblings. And but I had a brother pass when he was seven years of age, and that like shook us up. As he was the only boy, it was four girls and one boy, and I always remember him. You know, we playing around, and he went so sudden. My grandfather, my daddy, rather, met him. This lady, she didn't have any children. So she asked him if he would let, she choose to let me come to be, for her to, me to be company for her. And I went with her to live with her on, she was living on the fort, which is Fort Van Gassel. And while I was still, that is how I got to Salem Church which is located in Parliament Street. And I was about, I'll say about seven, almost seven when I went to stay with her. And I stayed with her until she died. In 1940, she died. So after she died, I went back to my mother. Well, I went to a little school and I lived there when I was 12 and attended night school at three nights, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, up and through Canyon Lane, with a retired teacher named Mr. Saunders. Some days we went to school, didn't have space, no classroom. We had to sit in the yard under the tree. And then it was only having classes like three, three times a week but we would go to school whenever. And at the age of 14, <coughs> excuse me, not as even, leaving age, whether you know anything or not, 14, you had to leave school. And I stayed there, I think I, there was, I was in the fifth grade and I left school. I enjoyed my time in school I went to junior school and I went to senior school. Like many others, Leroy and Louise both had to begin work at a very early age. My daddy used to wait to the bakery, to Kelly's bakery. So Miss Kelly, <coughs> she asked him, say, wait, he say, you have those children home, say, bring them, 
come bring them to the bakery. They could, we could um, give them something to do. I was still in school, but my other two sisters, they were out of school. I being the youngest, I was just 10. When I went to work to the bakery, and that was in 1940, the last part of, which was in December, I went there to work. And I spent 43 years there, working at the bakery. I leave school when I was 12 years old. Went to work to Kelly's Bakery. And from there, I, I worked with the domestic with Bruce Brennan on the delivery, traveling east. From there, I went to Kelly's Bake Shop for a couple of years. Then we leave for school in the morning, and I was at the bakery. I would go to work seven o'clock in the morning, and when the siren ring, that's quarter to nine. That is time for you to. We would leave for school. I would go to school. When I when school come out three o'clock, I would go back to work. And I go there to wash up the dishes, the pans, clean the table, the tables down, and all the cake utensils. That was my job. Condition I had to help to support myself and my family. My mother had two sons. And that's why I went to a delivery boy to Kelly's Bakery, worked with Bruce Brennan on the Eastern District, and I worked with Alphonse Johnson on the Western District. I think it was around about eight when I was getting about eight or ten shillings. This white lady who was waking in the cake room, she is related to the, the boss people, Miss Kelly and those, and she gets to like me. She, didn't have no, she wasn't married and she didn't have no children. But she said to me, she said, I love you. She said, I adopt you. So she showed me the way. She taught me the way how to save out of that eight and ten shillings. She told me, she said, now go, come, go to the post office. She told me where to go, you know, the post office is right now. We had a courthouse downstairs, and I have a bank book, and I used to put up like two shillings. It was rough to get a shilling a day. Go to work five o'clock in the morning, knock off around 10, 11 o'clock, wash the box off, and go home. You got to go to work at five o'clock in the morning to make them route delivery. As all great love stories go, at some point, boy meets girl, and for one dashing Leroy Popo, it was love at first sight. Meet at Kelly Bakery. She went there when she was 10, I went there when I was 12. And then we communicated with one another. Right through the bakery. He came, when I went to the bakery, I met him there. And from the time he set eyes on me, he said he married that same black girl there. He fell in love with me. And she was a nice, pretty black woman, and I said, that don't worry. And we had a good relationship. He used to take us out, take me out. One time he took, a, took me up to um, the Corona Club. They had a, it wasn't a club, it's like a restaurant. Before the marriage, took me to dinner. <laughs> Peace and rice chicken beach. <laughs> That's the first time he took me out to dinner. I went and see the two of us sitting up there eating. Oh, I was in my teenage then. But we had a good relationship. We used to go to Botany Dance on Friday evenings to the Silver Slippers. And, you know, we used to communicate, go to movies. And when he got to, when I took him to Mama to meet my mother. Well, right away she took to him and he took to her. And up for today, he always used to say, Miss Remus wasn't a mother in law, say she was a mother to me. Up Right up today, 
and he always would say that. And every, all of my siblings fell in love with him. Well, we used to go to Silver Slippers on holidays. As time passed, the pair grew more and more fond of each other. I didn't, he used to tell the, 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 the workers there, he never told me that. But he, he said he loved me, but he never tell me to my face. He had that telling them, you know, I same black girl that you marry or she can be my wife. You see? And, but I didn't love him. But I was just in my little teenage, you know how you see little boys, you, you, you know, you like, but we wasn't uh, serious like that. But we didn't get serious until when he went on the project. But the realities of the time would cause for this blossoming love story to be tested by time and distance. Between 1943 and 1965, an estimated 30,000 Bahamians migrated temporarily to the United States on a short-term basis to work in the agricultural sector. The program was created to fill labor shortages caused when Americans left U.S. farms to work in more profitable war industries or to serve in the armed forces during World War II. In the Bahamas, the program was sometimes referred to as the contract because each worker signed a contractual agreement to work in the U.S. Young Leroy Popo found himself as a teenager on his way to the U.S. to make a living, as the events on the world stage provided an opportunity he could not pass up. It did mean, however, love would have to wait. Back when I was 19, you had to have been 21, but I had the size. And the recruiting man, Mr. Stinger, he put me with a bunch of men. It was four Leroy's. He said, those are your foster parents because they were men. Leroy Miller, Leroy Nichols, Leroy Greenslade, and Leroy Popel. That's the four. Went to Miami, went north, went to Hebron, Maryland. From there, went to Salisbury, leave from there, transfer from there to Hamlin, New York, Picking apples. At night time, you wake with Duffy Mutt, the juice man, you see one of those names, the, the, the apple juice man. Came from there, come down to Florida, went on the East Coast. I can give you this. This, in my younger days, when Roy and I used to cars for he was on, on, the, um, on the contract. And I used to, when he, we write each other, and when to the end of the letter, we would write one song. Uh, every, every letter I used to write one song. But this song, what came to my mind, what I when it still it stood with me. There's a tree by the meadow, with a stream drifting by. And prone upon that I see, I love you till I die. I will always remember. That's that stuck with me. And I love that and the words of it, I will love you until I die. Wake in a place called Alva, Florida, near Fort Myers. That's where I learned to pick fruit. I'm a fruit picker. Stayed there a while and went from there. Went on the west, go to Palmetto, Florida. Leave from there. Went up north to Delaware. Wake up there. Wake up with Duffy Martin in a, in a factory. Cannon factory. From there, come back. Come back to Florida. Spend two years and a couple of months and come back home. 
The separation only intensified the strong feelings the couple had for each other, and eventually, the inevitable happened. I fly out on track with her, come back home. We got hooked up and we married. We married there in 1948. I was eight, I was 19 when I got married. When Miss Kelly, when I told Miss Kelly I was getting married, so I was waking there, so she, and I told her I was getting married. So that evening when I was that when I was supposed to get married, she told me that day. She's um she didn't tell me. She just said um she had them bake this cake and then I had to decorate it. She like make it look like it was an order. And it was a one twelve inch cake, round cake. And when I finish ice and decorate that, she said, now that is for you. That's the only thing when I had saying for cake. But we was poor, Roy had none, I had none. But me and get married. It was the love. After I walked to the church, because we wasn't far from Transfiguration Church. Walked there and walked back home. And when we got home, we met the crowd, the everybody who were in the yard in the house. And that's where we celebrate our marriage. And we bought a couple of bottles of soda was bought, there was in bottles then. So the neighborhood had to call the neighborhood after the wedding and everybody had a piece of cake and a bit of soda, not even a full bottle of soda. That's how we only got what we could afford. Because we was getting married and we wasn't going at no expense. What we had, we made do. And we break around 7 o'clock, say we going to the Silver Slippers, where the dancers. <laughs> then we start dancing now. So I went to Freddie Munnis, uh, Freddie Munnis, he was uh, So I went and Roy and I went to him and we told him, we told him we just got married. Roy, and he announced it. And he sang a song to us, to us, you know, on our wedding night. So it was good, and we went home. We didn't go on no honeymoon, because we had no money less here. Go in a hotel, you know, you couldn't go on a hotel here. Where you going? You might as well go to where you're going to go spend your honeymoon in your room. You understand? And we had a good time. And although we didn't have anything, God has blessed us abundantly. The couple fit together perfectly, like the right hand in the right glove, a team that was destined by fate to be together, and soon, children came along. But I thank God for my mother. I had all my children home. I had two midwives, and the last child I had was born, which is Dave. He was born in the hospital. Now, after you got married, we go to the show. Sometimes you go to the service service, but then we had a certain time. If you go to the show, you got to be back around 8.30 or 9 o'clock. My mother-in-law, Rachel Remus, she used to take care of the young ones. And she said, you have a certain time, be back home because I'm going to bed. So you had to be home to take care of them children. And that's the way we went from there. We wake as a team from day one. He never do something and I don't, he is sitting on his, I see him doing and I don't do. We wait together. For the children, after we start, the children got a certain age. Each one of them had a chore to do in the evening when they come from school, in the afternoon when they come from school. And they better do it. Because I'm home, I'm in the wake. The daddy the way, my mama looking after them. And when you see I come home, if they ain't do what I tell them to do, you'll hear about they'll hear about it. The first two were the closest. A year and a month between after that, we make an agreement. 
you got to be. They can drop three to four years in between. So this one could change the napkin on that one and get his body milk. When the baby cry, she take a watch, I take a watch. She catching up, I wake the children when I sleepy. I catch an app and that's where you raise our children as a partnership. Along with providing a secure environment for their children, the Popals also focused on instilling good, godly principles into the minds and hearts of those entrusted to them by God. But she, she is hold fast to religious faith and our Lord. So I, I would have been the child who would have interacted a lot, particularly with regards to a large issues. I go this way, go that way, go drop this one, pick this one up, that sort of stuff. And when I became a single parent, they took on my four children and I. They took on the responsibilities of helping to pay the utility bills, even taking their old age pension money and buying bread basket items so that my children and I would have food to eat. Taking care of my children while I go on a second job, and that is starting from feeding them first thing in the morning until I get there in the afternoon to pick them up where they have already taken a bath and clean clothes on them first to head to the east. I remember many times I would bring my dirty clothes saying to him, cause he'll be the first one I would see and say, now when I get back, I'm going to wash. But when I return, clothes already washed, fall up in the basket, just for me to pick up and put my car ahead east again. And so there are so many, but those two really stand out because those moments were the lowest, I would say, the lowest level in my life, having to care for four children as a single parent, not by choice. And my children, when they say, well, I'm going to get married. I don't get in it. You like Susie. You like Henry. That's that. You bring them to me. And I don't get in it. DeRoy and Louise, realizing the growing needs of the family, purpose to build a home, a place they and the children could call their own. I don't mean to have anything. God has blessed us abundantly through the years. In my marriage, we built three houses. The first house was a clapboard. And after, <clears throat> that was in Camp Road. And after my daddy said to me, um, so we was having the children, he said, now, this property is big enough, say, Roy, you and Roy can build on this house, on this property. So you, mommy, you won't have to be toting the children up and down. And we had bicycles, no car. So he said, you could, mommy could, you could build right here. Mommy could look at the children in the day. So we, Roy, built a, a house right on the property, three bedroom. That's right. And after the children began, um, started to get big and it was getting too big for the three bedroom and one bath. Many times I in the bathroom, they knocking on the door, I gotta hurry up because they have to get to school. So, but, so we say, Roy, we, we had this piece of property down here. I say, Roy, time for us to get a bigger house. So I tell you what, we could build, but I ain't going to go borrow no money. You buy the food, and I will buy material, and he did the work. This house would be sitting in today. Seven years it took us to build that, to build this house. And when we was through, we didn't owe a soul a penny. Memories, the connection was when I was able to help my, my father build this, the same house. In the afternoon, when we, when he comes home from from his work, he, he he does construction as a carpenter, and we will walk from Market Street to Chippenham. Every, just with every day, 
to build this house until it was completed. My father built this house with the help of his family, myself included. By building this house, he showed me how to have stickability, discipline, responsibility. What stands out for me in that marriage of mommy and daddy is the fact that they built their house, their own hands, and they had their own jobs in the day. But in the afternoon, they would come down here. And like how this time has changed, they'll be coming down here on bicycle. Not no car or truck, bicycle. And then mommy would leave Kelly's bakery and daddy would leave his construction job and they'll come down here and they'll work on this house. And then they'll all trade home by way of the graveyard. Going from here, from Chippingham into Grantstown. They have done so much, but so little. Um, I did not have an average uh, child life, like per se. Like, oh, that's all like holidays and weekends off. I remember coming down here, riding from um, Chippen from um, Grandstand to Chippenham every weekend, every holiday. And it was very few that I could say that I had free. You know, um, from I knew myself, I was building this house. That was amazing. From then. One time, um, I told Johnny to something I told him to do. He did it. But when he got through, he went on the government ground to go play basketball and I basketball his tail. So Mama, when I was beating him, Mama's, Mama, I had him hook right up, Johnny, hook right up. So Mama said to me, she, come, she came to me and she pulled my hand off him. Say, don't you ever beat your children when you when you mad. Wait till you cool down. And from then, I don't never beat them when I'm mad or get in a passion. Discipline was something that, like she said earlier, um, it was never done in the heat of the moment. She always was a cool down and, you know, I always say that my best beat will come from, from my dad. <laughs> Because if you go as my bar, you know, that was a wicked beating. <laughs> then they say, when you're going someplace, let me know where you're going. You have a certain time to come in. Because I tell them, only one man and one woman home. I closed my door at a certain time. And we never had no problem. Just yelling and whatnot, that don't go with me. Never had a problem with my children. But I didn't have no tr trouble with none of my children. I raised the seven of them. <clears throat> Never had one day go to a school, go out to the courthouse or some neighbor come and tell me, your child so and so, and or disrespectful. My mother taught us. We couldn't pass a neighbor unless we speak. And if that neighbor, we don't speak and that neighbor come and tell her, you know what we can get. Mama's tell you straight, you and that person ain't no company. You speak. And I brought my children up the same way. And teach them what you want, you wait for it. I was brought up in a Christian home. My mother and my father always made sure that we go to church every Sunday, three times on Sunday. That's Sunday morning, Sunday school, and, and church in the evening. There's one occasion that I had with my parents where mommy always used to beat me. She was a beater. But one time in my life, my daddy beat me. I was 16 and I still stays with me today. When you're sent to the shop, you go where you are sent and you come back home. You don't go playing around. So when he, when I finally got home, that was a whooping. 
It was a Saturday afternoon. I still remember that to the day. And I was 61. Here's Christopher who went home early to his, his reward, eternal reward. Then shows up Johnny. I'm a very special child. Some of my persistence tell me, brother tell me that mama got too spoiled. Mom used mama favorite. But I got the most beaten. And so I thank them both um, for not doing chores and a tammy man, etc., etc. I love and adore them. I'm the sixth child. Okay. My parents are highly religious, particularly my mother. Um, it was always large, large, large. Um, my father was wake, wake, wake. Um, my dad himself was would always be considered a disciplinary person. I think I took the most cut up in my lifetime. It wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. Um, but I survived it and it's instilled in me the importance of respect. And I'm living with that today. A lot of times I was beaten. I get when they seemed to want. You know, it was never out of order or whatever. You know, just a look. And that's there. Would stay in the right way. More than two decades had passed, and the raising of children had given way to the welcoming of grandkids. I'll never forget that day at St. Michael's preschool. The younger just a little toddler, and now Papa Pope walking from from school, coming home, and Papa Pope got a little snacks with her. That's such a, a sight I'll never forget. And to this day, I'll always be grateful of that time and that moment. For the grandchildren, it was only me and Ron that actually lived here. All of the other grandchildren visited, but me and Ron were the only grandchildren that actually lived, stayed here. So me and Ron, we spent a lot of time around Grammy and Papo. So with Papo, um, me going to school, Papo used to take me to school on his shoulder, walk with me to St. Michael's um, on his shoulder um, with Grammy. Grammy used to be I guess I was a bit of a nosy when I was younger. I don't know, a little nosy, but I used to ask Grammy a lot of questions. I think my, my grandparents always taught me from, from a small child uh, to always uphold your name, the Popal name, the Popal standard. Um, your name is all you have. Um, and then also to put God first. And then thirdly, to always, always hold family in high regard. I ain't gonna talk about when me and Darren sneak out and ride bikes when Grammy went to go pick up a papa for that one time and they say don't go out. I ain't gonna talk about when Pizza the Cop gets you fired when they should kill Laurent. Anyway, anyway, they'll never find out with that. I can remember there were times when my father used to bring us here in terms of, you know, sleeping over on the weekend. And it was during the time of like John Cano time, you know, Papa would come and, you know, he knocked to the door and he would um, tell us, boys, let's go get up, get ready, let's go. And, you know, we would get ready and, you know, he would take us to John Cano. We would walk from here, from Chippenham on Bay Street. What stands out the most to me, if I can say, is that when my father left, when I was 13, my grandparents, and as well, by extension, my aunts and my uncles, they just, they just came right in and helped to nurture all of us. And we are who we are today because of the foundation that Grammy and Papa instilled. Grammy actually teach, taught me how to bake a little bit. Um, I remember when we used to but she used to be like, oh, Grammy, I want, to want you to show me how to do this. And she would have given me a piece of cardboard, and I used to ice in the cardboard. So now I think that's where I get a little of my baking traits from, from my Grammy. So everyone would talk with their side song. I hope used to just tear us up because he wanted to make sure we were supposed to do what we were supposed to be doing. He was tough, especially for me and like the oldest at Darren, but I should go on. He was the oldest at, so he didn't play. And it came to that. All this fun time, Papa Bob and now with all these grandchildren and trees and Katie, them dancing up and doing the chicken dance. That wasn't, no. What we used to get was the beaten dance. That's what we used to get. Um, but you know what? In the end, it turned out to be, you know, you really kind of appreciated the ethic of hard work he kind of gave us. So I must say that Papa and grandmother, in terms of discipline, it was always and manners and respect. 
Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Grammy would be in the kitchen most of the time, baking, as she does. And Papa used to do little odds and ends around the house, plus assist Grammy in the kitchen. But Grammy always sent us to the food store, to Early Bird, right here on Boyd Road. And Papa used to write down the list for us, the, the grocery we needed to get. And he used to stand right on the corner, watch us. He said, I'm going to watch you. And he stood there in the corner, watch us, well, watch me walk to Early Bird and back. Looked at the list, looked at the bag, made sure I got everything on the bag. And it was Grammy money that she was giving me. But Papa used to say, no, you keep the change, keep the change. But when I got back inside, Grammy used to be like, where my change, where my change? Hey, Grammy has her way of doing things, and Papa has his way of doing things. And all two of them is the right way, but they just have different ways of doing it. And they don't really get angry at each other or whatever. They just be like, hey, whatever works at the end of the day, we can make it work and we can work this out. A lot of grandchildren used to be here at the same time, and Jackie's children, Bianca, Laron, used to be here at the same time. And our parents, they, it's like they don't, they never left any food for us. But I guess because we were in Chippenham with Grammy and Papa, they made sure that we had food. And so what Grammy used to do, she used to send for the spaghetti, just the spaghetti. And Papa used to cut up the hot dogs, put that in the spaghetti, and everybody had a share of that. And that is what fostered a close relationship amongst the grandchildren. And even now, when I think about it, all of my siblings who are not here, Brunson, Brendan, and Brendia, we always reminisce of the times we shared in Chippenham. I want to say thank you so much to Grammy for everything that you've done for me. Where I am today could not have been possible without your assistance, but also without God's assistance and my family. Um, I also miss the many times we shared together in the kitchen, baking, and talking about life, and you always being there for me in support of my um, academic and personal accomplishments. I also want to say thank you so much, Papo, for everything that you've done for me. I flash back many times when you used to walk me to school when I was attending CC Sweeney Junior High School in grade seven, and the many times you used to discipline me when I um, <laughs> stole the plants from the nursery. <laughs> Um, but I'm grateful for your um, discipline and your strong presence in my life. Papo, Grammy, I love you guys. I mean, your, your lives, your lifestyle, everything has been admirable. I mean, you guys are the most humble people I know. Humble, humble and happy. My favorite Leroy, all of these moments was happy then. And Papo sat me down one day and explained Spending like three hours straight for his contract job in South Carolina, Alabama, Atlanta. I was just telling you about the hard work he did. I think that's one of the things that got for me most is his hard work, you know what I mean? Being a, being a support of the family, being very stern and strict, but at the same time, loving. Like Diane Popo, I mean, she always there helping. Every time I leave, put something in my hand. Um, really encouraged me. And like, on this medical journey, she always encouraged me to say, son, just get through so I can see you across the stage. That's what I'm asking God for. For the many years of love and affection shown. Thank you for the many years of consoling words. Pope on your 90th birthday, happy birthday. To the Pope was on the 65th, happy anniversary. Um. Uh, Pope in general taught me how to be disciplined. Um, as a carpenter, I watched him, especially my daddy. Um, he was he would go up five o'clock in the morning and go to sea. He always knew how to cap himself. He always wore the best, and he always put out the best. We always got the best from him. As as well, I always got the best from him as a grandson, and always had a bit of an encouraging word, a strong word, but very encouraging. Across the street from where we presently are now. Back then, Papa had some goats, and you know, we used to go next door and pretty much, you know, feed the goats and so forth. Those were the Saturdays that my mother would drop me here, and 
I would spend the day with them. And I would always remember Grammy teaching me how to bake and Papa teaching me how to use the hula hoop and stuff and I would sit down and watch golf with them. There's no way to say it, there's no way to really show it because they've done so much for me from, like I say, from when I was born. I known them to be my only grandparents and the way they raised my mother was the same way she raised me. So now I know when I have a family someday, eventually later on in the future, I know how to take care of my wife and my kids and my household because of the example that they set to me. It was last year when our house was being renovated with the paint and Zion was about a week years old. Grammy those were available and opened their doors to me and Zion for two weeks. And at the end of the two weeks, Zion got ill. And I remember this vividly when he began to get sick on that Sunday evening. Grammy stayed up until we got our transportation tickets to the hospital. And I went, we went and knocked on their door and said, I'm not sure if you will have enough money in case Zion has to get some test done. And the little money that Papo had, he went in his wallet, took out a couple of dollars and said, hey, Daughter, take this in case we may need something. And that said out a lot for me because he never did that. And it really touched me. And I'll always remember that moment he shared with us. Someone well, always say that if you don't have it, you do it out. And you save until you get it. And that would be your setup throughout my life. Um, whatever I want to achieve in life, I like save up to it and just do it. My parents has been a, a greater support to me, I must say. Um, it wasn't until the first, my first child, Bianca, the way they have interacted with them, I've always been supportive. And I, 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 they have always shown support and assistance that Bianca's are bringing. And I'll always be grateful for that. And um, I asked them at their 50th wedding anniversary, what is the greatest um, advice you give to all of us? And they said to put God first. And then the next advice was keep the other third party out. And whoever that third party, that other third party is, we know what it is. It could be the in-laws, could be the outlaws, could be the, the friends, could be the family, could be anybody. But keep that other third party out. He showed me how to be responsible, how to exercise the capability, how to be, and I, I'm going to use a big word, but it means simple. He was very meticulous, like a good skilled surgeon. That, that at which I took a beat to the police force, follow the fundamentals, be training, exercise, be responsible, do your job well, show respect to your superiors. But if you're right, you must hold your ground. That's what Daddy basically taught me. Uh, one of the lessons that I've learned is to be responsible in your spending and to make sure that your bills are paid so you have a roof over your head. Okay? Always pay your bills. And other things, to be a person that anybody can come to and ask for advice. The times. The love. The legacy. 65 years of devotion to God, each other, and their children. Leroy and Louise Popo have steadfastly demonstrated over more than six decades of marriage after seven children, 15 grandchildren, and seven great grandchildren that integrity, commitment, faithfulness, unequivocal love, and devotion is possible in a marriage as long as God is truly at the center of the union between one man and one woman. And my parents have lived a long life, particularly my father as he approaches 90, his 90th birthday. I wish God could continue to hold him fast. And for my mother, the same thing. I want to say to my parents, thank you for the many years, the time she shared. I thank them for what they have instilled in me over these years, um, to do the best that we can, to do it right the first time, because going back over something takes longer. And um, if you're gonna do something, do it to the best of your ability. I don't care what it is. 
and that still goes with me today. I, I pray for them every day that God will continue to strengthen them. In fact, every morning when I come here to check on them before going to work, my words to them going outside the door, and even if I forget, I would return, open the door, and I would say to them, keep your eyes on the prize. Don't forget. Keep listening. And if I miss you, I'll see you on the other side. They are the greatest. They are my heroes. That's what I have to say. I can look them in their face and be proud that I held them openly and I. I'll always remember my parents. I pray that God will give him some more years in this age. You know, I remember so vividly when Daddy got ill at the hospital and it stood out. Daddy used to be embarrassed. I was coming to the hospital. All was lined off. All seven of us lined off one morning, afternoon, and evening to visit by the hospital. He said, I'm like, oh, go. He said, Daddy, no. You were always there for us. And because you were always there for us, Daddy, we are here for you. I must say that grandmother and grandfather for the amount of years we've been together for some 65 years together. It's amazing to be able to be together with just one person. And like myself and other persons who are married and expect to get married, I hope that they will pretty much be like a role model for us and that I hope and pray that God will consistently bless them as they continue to grow. So there's no real way or words to really show it. It's just like you have to let them know that you appreciate everything and everything they have done. All of the lessons they have learned growing up from the 1920s to 2014, they still here, they still kicking. They've been seeing stuff going on from that time to this time. They're like a history book. If you sit down and talk to them any day, they'll tell you all kind of stuff about the Bahamas that I'm pretty sure not a lot of people might know. Family is all you have. At the end of the day, that is all you have. And so, I am so, so very thankful for my grandparents. Words can't even express. Money can't even, and there's not even enough money. But my actions, the way I live my life, through God, through my mother, through the examples of my grandparents, is a reflection of who they are. I would say thank you for all the memories shared with them. And for the 14 years they've been in my life, and I'm grateful for having them because some children, they don't never see their grandparents and I'm just grateful that I get to see them. I can't say thanks in no amount of money and no amount of words. All I can say thanks is my love and my gratitude to them each and every day. And I pray that God continue to bless them and keep them. And I pray that their legacy will surely live on within Zion and myself. I would say, first of all, thanks to God. And also thanks to grandfather and also grandmother. And I will describe them to be excellent grandparents. I don't think we'll ever find no one like grandpapa or grandmother ever, ever in life. There's no words that I can actually say to say thanks. I try to show them as much daily of how much I really appreciate them. And I really do love them. And I will do anything for them. Um, and I wish, I mean, with them, I know there may be a day, but I will just appreciate the days that I have with them now. And I just want to tell them that I really, really do love them. Just awesome. The Sipanarians. I would describe them as fabulous. Oh boy, unforgettable. Awesome. Awesome. My advice, I would leave with them, is for them to live as one. That is my priority, for them to live as one. Not like how I see some sisters and brothers and family apart. It grieves me to see how some family live, but as my family, that is my desire that they live in peace with one another. Live like how me and your mind live, not a problem. You never go to bed angry. Oh man, 
beautiful in order to misunderstand it. If I say something and offend him, she'll say, well, don't say that. And if she says something to me, I just said, forget it. And that's it. No problem, not a bit. That's my girl. I told him, and he told, told, he told me, he said, we should go, we signed a contract. I said, yes. <laughs> I said, we signed a contract. He said, in that contract is until that do us part. And when I took that vow, the two of us, that's what we meant. Until that do us part. We say in sickness and in health, and plenty times when I see he's in pain, the tears will come. My heart will get full. And I remember the vows until death do us part. We don't know the truth is going first. But we will remain true and true and faithful to each other. Because we took that vow the first day in November 1948. Okay, and I will love him until I die. Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream for the soul who died that slumber and thinks not what it seems. Life is real, life is honest, but the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art to dust return, it was not spoken of the soul. Not enjoyment, not in sorrow, is our destiny to end away, but to act that each tomorrow find us further than today. Longfellow.